Good morning. How's everybody feeling today? That is awesome. I'm tired. I know that feeling. I, um, I've had a busy couple of weeks. And uh, from all this business, I learned that our lives are fluttered. Let me rephrase that. My life is cluttered. I cannot claim no, your lives are cluttered. Some of you are retired. I'm not going to say your life is as cluttered. But it's amazing to me how much we have going, in our, going on in our lives. We have family, work, school, church, activities, playtime, study time, bill paying time, not bill paying time. There always seems to be more stuff that needs to be done than time in the day to get it done. We'll figure it out. As most of you know, uh, we moved this past week into a new house. And the most important lesson that I learned in these weeks, I got a lot of stuff. <laughs> a lot of stuff. Tim will attest that there's a lot of books. Because he moved probably most all of them. <laughs> or at least it felt like it. And he's right, I have a lot of books. But it seems to me that everyone has a lot of stuff. There's TV shows that talk about people who are hoarders, they keep everything. There's some lady out there who will come in and she will declutter your life. So now we have to pay someone to help us clean up our clutter. It's awesome. If we look around in our homes, we look in the closets, the junk drawers, the junk closet, the garage. Now the interesting aspect of the garage is the garage is where we're supposed to put our car. 82% of American homes, I had to look this up, 82% of American homes have a two-car garage. Of that 82% of the homes, only 15% park a car in the garage. <laughs> That's not very many. Which means the one place that was designed to hold our car isn't doing its job correctly. And it proves that we have to have some place to put our stuff. Now, I've lived in the Tri-Cities three and a half years, and in that time, I've watched two large rental storage facilities be built. That's on top of the four, I think, that already existed within two miles of my house. They added two more. And they're not little places. These are big places with lots of little garages to park our stuff. So I'm curious, has anyone else had this urge, this feeling, that there needs to be a fire? <laughs> now, not a big fire that hurts somebody, but a fire just big enough to burn up our stuff so that the insurance company gives us a fat little check and we get a clean slate. <laughs> I'm just asking, you know, it was a thought I had. Um, except that where all my stuff is, is my house, and I'm like, I don't really want to hurt the house, it's just the stuff. But if I move it all out front, there's a fire, they call that a bonfire, insurance doesn't pay for bonfires. <laughs> but I keep holding my breath. And so as I was going through the text that we're going to be looking at, by the way, there is no PowerPoint, there is no handout. We're going to look at the Word, we're going to talk about the Word, and then we get to go home. If you want to take notes, <laughs> that's reading nap and a lunch. I, I'm hearing you. I get it. Um, but I was thinking about our Christianity and how, like our lives, it can get cluttered. And I got a little disturbed by that because I thought, hmm, that, that's kind of rough. Our Christianity can get cluttered up by a bunch of stuff. 
up more time? More money? More. And our life hearts, Christianity gets cluttered. And, and the part that got me was that the gospel, which is the teaching or revelation of Jesus Christ, is good news. I'll say it again. The, teach, the gospel is the teachings and revelation of Jesus Christ, and it's called the good news. But if I clutter it up to where I get resentful, and it's, oh, I gotta get up to work on church. I gotta bake snacks. I gotta watch the kids. I gotta do crafts. I gotta sit through a sermon from Larry or Brian. And you know how long they drag on. It's not like they don't like the sound of their voice. And we forget the gospel is simply God's overwhelming grace and mercy for us. He gives it freely. There's nothing we do, nothing we say, nothing we plan that affects that. That's God's gift to us. And guess what? He plugs in time every day to love on you, to give to you, to make time for you. And not once in the back of his head does he go, oh, I gotta deal with him today. I gotta hang out with her today. No, in his mind he goes, oh man, guess what I get to do today? I get to hang out with Nicole. I get to hang out with Tim. I get to hang out with Mike. Even Mike. <laughs> and he's going, it's awesome! Not once does he go, oh, come on. I can't do this anymore. He loves us and desires a relationship with us so much. And yet we clutter it up. We think about how we're going to affect this and make it better. It's this message of grace that Paul had spent time with the churches in Galatia giving them. This, great, this lesson on grace and mercy from God. And that it's freely given. And it was interesting because they understood it. They got the message. It made it in. He left and they were thriving. They were, they were still out talking about it. Oh, this is so awesome. The churches were growing. There was love in the air and they liked one another. They liked other people and it just kept going. But along comes these salesmen. These, these Honest, in a way. Well, meaning as they were. And they came in and they said things like, you're Christians. That's awesome. He said, I, I know God. I've hung with him most of my life. Look, look at me. I, I, I can show you. I've lived there. I've been there. My whole life has been wrapped up in him. I got a whole book talks about him. You're Christians. That's great. But there's these laws. Do you know the laws? Are you following the laws? Can you show them? Can you prove it to me? And they, and they convinced the Galatians, the church in Galatia, the Gentiles, that there was this other stuff, this clutter to bring in. They've been living with grace. They knew it. They got it. They were transformed by it. And yet these salesmen, we talked about them for the last couple of weeks. They're the Judaizers, the legalistic people who said, hey, hang on now. We were here first. We've been doing this for years. My daddy, my daddy, daddy, generations we've been doing this. Rules, we had them. We've lived by them. Not always, most of them sometimes. But we tried really hard. We worked at it. We cluttered it up. And the 
in house and, and, and they were in Galatia and they knew they had grace, they understood it. Yet some of them went, maybe if I work a little harder, I'll make it better. Maybe they're right. We gotta do something. And so Paul's frustrated. He's hearing all this and he's like, wait a minute. I don't get this. I don't fathom this 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 confusion that you've allowed to come in. You're you're letting the Judaizers come in and and change and clutter up what you have, which was this beautiful relationship where God loved on you and you loved on God and then you loved on each other. What are you doing? So he writes in verse one, trying to get their attention. He says. It, I, he says, it is for freedom that Christ has set us free. Stand firm then, and do not let yourselves be burdened again by the yoke of slavery. So that's powerful. He lays it out. He says, wait a minute. What did Christ do? He died for you so that you would be free. Now a lot of people are going to look at this and say, free. What did Christ do? And the first place you're going to go is Christ made you free from sin. The problem with that statement is this. The day you came to know Jesus Christ, whether it was 10 minutes ago, 10 years ago, or 30 years ago, I'm going to ask the question. From the day you met him, fell in love with him, and accepted him, have you sinned? Most everybody in here is going to say yes. Well, if Christ set you free from sin, this statement doesn't make sense. But it's not that he set you free from sin. He didn't change your human nature. He's working with you on it. The Spirit's here working with you every day. And the reason the Spirit's here is because God knew we're human. And to be honest, we're dumb. We just don't think it through all the time. Open mouth, insert foot syndrome. Happens all the time. I think the cows call it open mouth disease. We got the same thing. We stick our foot in our mouth, we do something stupid, we sit. And you know it works because all of a sudden the spirit says, do! And that guilt kicks in. You're like, oh man. So when, when Paul tells him, it is for freedom that Christ has set you free, it's not that he sets you free from sin. What he sets you free from was the yoke of slavery. Now the Jews understood this because they had the law. 613 laws. And they had to live them out and live them out perfectly. Perfectly. But it's not doable. Now the Gentiles didn't have those laws. But the Gentiles had the Greco-Roman gods that they dealt with, who had a whole bunch of rules, a whole bunch of things you're supposed to do. And when you don't do them, you had to pay a penalty. So for the Gentiles, understanding this yoke of slavery made sense because they come from religions, little r, with gods, little g, that they were trying to hang on to and, and get away from. So they understood that when Paul tells him it is for freedom that Christ has set us free, stand firm then and do not let yourselves be burdened again by the yoke of slavery. They could correlate what the Jews were coming from to the Gentiles. He could make it so they could see the similarity. They had these, these religions that they had rules to follow. And he's telling them, don't go back to that. Christ died so you wouldn't have to. You could be set free from those rules. He goes on in verses 2 and 3 to tell them, mark my words. I, Paul, tell you that if you let yourselves be circumcised, Christ will be of no value to you at all. Again, I declare to every man who lets himself be circumcised that he is obligated to obey the whole law. He's letting them know, look, if you do this one thing, which at the time they were pushing three things, circumcision, dietary changes, and one other, which literally just went out of my head, but at least the two we know, so 
circumcision and dietary changes. He's saying if you take on one of these, you've got to do them all. And Christ will be of no value to you. And that's a harsh statement to think about. Christ died to set us free from the law. Our faith is in Christ. If we take that step and we're, go we're going to take this step and do something, in effect, we're saying Christ wasn't enough. He wasn't sufficient. I now have to make this up and get it right because we're so good at it. If you take that step that you knew what needed to be done, you're invalidating what Christ did for you. That's a lot to take on. Because now there's 613 laws that generations of people could not do. And it pointed to a Savior and a need for one because they couldn't do it. And here we are with the Gentiles being told, you got to do this. Paul continues in verse 4. You who are trying to be justified by the law have been alienated from Christ. You have fallen away from grace. I don't know about you guys, but that last part. You have <laughs> fallen away from grace. The best gift ever given. And you get to fall away from it if you follow those rules, those, those laws. I, I just, I think about the things I keep taking on and, and thinking about and what ifs. And I don't know how tomorrow would, would be if I were to fall away from grace. Because I know where I was before grace got me. And I gotta tell you, it wasn't a fun place. Remember that grace is unmerited, unearned, and undeserved. Yet God freely gives it. All we have to do is to take our broken, tired, scared, <coughs> lonely bodies and reach out an empty hand and accept it. He told us that. He said, it's on me. I got this. Just accept it. And so many of us struggle to accept to receive. It's hard. We're so used to getting. Doing what I told you a week ago. Pull you up by your bootstraps. Work harder. We're so used to that mentality <clears throat> that it's really hard for us to go, thanks, and just accept it. It doesn't make sense. It doesn't, it doesn't work with how we're built sometimes. And yet God says simply, it's here. Grab it. I'm giving it to you. No charge. It's covered. It's taken care of. And too many of us have to go, I don't understand. I don't get it. Somehow I feel like I have to improve and, and get better. And I should be doing something to, to be worthy of this gift. 
verse 5, Paul continues. For through the Spirit we eagerly await by faith the righteousness for which we hope. For through the Spirit. When Christ left, he told the apostles, hey, I'm going to send a helper, a comforter, an advocate. He was referring to the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit would be here to give us strength when we're at our weakest. To lift us up from the deepest, darkest pits that we find ourselves in. The Spirit is there to do everything for you, through you, and with you that you are unable to do on your own. He never fails. When you're headed down a wrong path, he's going to put something in the way to try to steer you back to where you need to be. He's with you when you have no idea what you should be praying for. He's searching the deepest, darkest corners of your being to help clear it out. The Holy Spirit is the deep clutterer of your soul. He's there to weed out the stuff that gets in your way. He's there to point you to the people who can help you. He's there to help you get face to face with God with empty hands and an open heart to say, thank you. The Holy Spirit is there to intercede for you when your brain is so locked up that you just have no idea what to say, what to ask, you're sitting in the fetal position in a corner, sucking on your thumb, going, I have no idea what to do. I have no idea where to go. And he's right there holding you. And he calls out to the Father and says, here's where it is. And the Father will intercede. Even when you don't know that you need it. You have all these wants and desires you think you're supposed to be asking for. He understands what you want, but he knows what you need. And he's going to try to nudge you in that direction. The Holy Spirit will intervene and help guide you. Keep in mind in verse 5, he says, Through the Spirit, we eagerly await through faith. We eagerly await through faith. The belief in things unseen. Faith. I don't see it, but I believe it. It doesn't say, The Spirit will eagerly await through faith and your works. Doesn't say faith and your actions, faith and your steps. No. It says the Spirit, through the Spirit, we eagerly await through faith. God is once again said, Hey, we got this. Just let us know. Await in faith. It's not our actions. And remember, the Holy Spirit is there to help build your faith. Trust Him to do it. Finally, in verse 6. For in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision has any value. The only thing that counts is faith expressing itself through love. To me, this was the most critical part of this passage. This one sentence sums up our Christian walk and how to prove that it's perfect. Read it again. For in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision has any value. The only thing that counts is faith. 
faith, expressing itself through love. Paul's saying, whether you're circumcised or not circumcised, it doesn't matter. The Jews were circumcised. Paul was circumcised. But the Gentiles weren't. And yet, both got grace and salvation through Jesus Christ. So circumcised or not circumcised didn't matter. Whether they had the laws before or not didn't matter. Whether they got up on the left side of the bed or the right side of the bed didn't matter. None of this stuff mattered. The only thing that counts is faith expressing itself through love. It's pretty simple. The only thing that counts is faith expressing itself through love. So, I pondered that. That was a tough sentence for me. I said, my faith expressing itself through love. Faith is a belief in things I don't see. Just give me a minute. How am I going to do that in, in, in some sort of expression of love? Because if I don't see it, how do I love you? How does my faith express itself through love? Okay, Google didn't help. I tried. It's not even a joke. If I can't figure out something, I Google. And you type it in, it just says, yep, that's where you'll find it. This was the chapter and verse. There's where you'll find it. And I'm like, well, that didn't help. So I started trying to go back through all the lessons I've learned. All the verses I know. And I gotta be honest, I don't know as many as I probably should. But I came up with two. Then I kind of went, maybe those work. The first one, everyone knows it. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. John 3.16. That every baseball game, half the football game, most of the people in the stadium go, I have no idea what that means, but it's a sign I'm with. So I can see the play. God loved the world, whoever believes. God loves for anyone with faith. God loves anyone with faith. So now that narrowed it down. Ten specimens. I think it's God loves the whole world. And anyone that believes will not perish and have eternal life. So God loves everyone. Those who believe, who have faith, will not perish but have eternal life. Okay. Well, what else can I lean on to try to put this together? And I went to Matthew 22, verses 35 to 40. Jesus is being tested. They, they asked him, what is the greatest commandment? Everyone in this room has heard this ten times this year alone. When asked what is the greatest commandment in the law, Jesus replied, Love the Lord with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the first great commandment, and the second is love your neighbors as yourself. All the law and prophets hang on these two commandments. So these are two powerful statements from the Word of God. And they tell us the same thing. God loves everyone. Jesus says we have to love God and love our neighbors. And what's one of Ryan's favorite statements about our neighbors? Who are our neighbors? Everyone. Yes. Everyone. Know them, don't know them. Like them, don't like them. Most of us can sit in this room and go, well, I like that half of the country. I like that politician. I like this group of people. I like most of that group of people. I like her. I like him. About half the people in the room. We can all do it. We sit at home. We've done it. Oh, I don't like him. I'm changing the channel. And yet, God loves everyone. Jesus commands us to love our neighbors, and our neighbors are everyone. And Paul had just 
told us the only thing that counts is faith expressing itself through love. Part of this hit me driving down the road. My favorite place to be, I love driving. I don't care where it is, I will drive. I, if you want to go there, I will drive you there. I have no problem. I love driving. The farther, the better. As long as I'm behind the wheel, I'm a happy camper. Most of the time. So I'm going down a road, and that guy, and I'm going to use guy just as a generic, it's not a specific guy, it's just that guy. Male, female, tall, short, that guy. That guy who cut the line. That guy who passed me only to realize he wanted the exit that's two feet away. <laughs> Comes right back across the nose of my car. That guy. Itself through love. All of a sudden, in my brain, I went, Love that guy. <laughs> I'm supposed to love that politician, that group, this group, my family, my outlaws, my, I'm sorry, my in laws, <laughs> all of them. I have to love that guy I see every morning in the mirror. All the time. With that question. Now I'm a big fan of the three of us, me, myself, and I. If we are getting along, it's a good day. But it's not always that the three of us are getting along. One of us is usually messed up the night before and gotten us all in trouble with Roy. <laughs> and I can tell you, it usually wasn't me. It was the other one. But I have to get up and look in the mirror and I have to love him every day. And I have to go to where I work and love them every day. I have to love the guy who cut me off and caused me to hit the curb and think really bad thoughts. I have to love him too. I have to love that lady in the checkout line with her $192 in coupons, 32 of which have expired, but she thinks she should get the huge. I have to love her. I have to love the checkout person, the bag person, the kid on the bike, the drunk on the corner who's there every day asking me for a hug. I have to love that scary group of people downtown where I don't generally go after 8 p.m. And I'm supposed to love them every day without question. And I don't have to do it because God said I should. I have to do it because that is my faith expressing itself through love. If God loved me unconditionally, and I've been told over and over again, that it didn't matter what my sin was. It didn't matter where I came from. It didn't matter what I did or didn't do. God loved me anyway. It doesn't matter how bad I think I was. It doesn't matter that the court system said I was bad. Or my ex-wife said, oh, by the way, I'm supposed to love her too. And my ex-in-laws, who never liked me anyways, <laughs> supposed to love them too, every day. And not because I have to, because then it's me working. It's letting the Holy Spirit support me in those moments when I don't want to love anybody. It's allowing it's surrendering the control that I want to hold on my life and 
finally saying, God, I want to love her, but it's really hard for me because I don't always get it because I know who I am and where I came from. And even though you forgave me, I still struggle forgiving myself. So how am I supposed to allow my faith to express itself in love if I can't love and forgive me? And you've got to go, Spirit, Father, Jesus, help me. Help me get better. Help me understand that, yeah, I've got to change it, but I don't need to break into it because you're there. We come to church, not because we have to, but because we love being here. The tithes and offering is taken not because we have to, but because we want to. We love giving. If you don't get up in the morning going, I cannot wait to get to church, If this is an obligation, if this is a chore that you have to do, don't come. That's not your faith expressing itself in love. That's your stubbornness going, I need to do something. When you get up and it's time to give, don't give because God might not see, Mariah might see you not give. Want to say something? Want to bring it up next week about more? <laughs> give because you want to give. You love giving. Don't give because you have to. If you're giving because you have to, stop giving. Don't do it. The Spirit will help you express your faith in love. When you get up in the morning, the Spirit's going to go, it's time to love on someone. In your body, you go, man, I can't wait. Who's it going to be? God, are you going to point them out for me, or do I just got to start picking everyone So I find the one that you were thinking of? You gotta want it. You've got to allow the spirit to show you how you can get to where you want it. Don't show up because it's 1030. Everybody else is gonna be there. It'll look funny if I'm not. You better go. Don't go. Don't show up. Want to be here. When it's time to give, want to give. When you're out and about, don't go, oh, I'm obligated to help that homeless person. Want to help them. Express your faith through love and let the Spirit show you how. Is it easy? Oh, dear God, no. If it was, everybody would be doing it already. It's contrary to how we live. Most of us live fight or flight. I'm either going to fight you or I'm going to run from you. Most of us don't walk up freely. Like we need to hug you. I'm a scary person to some people. I don't get it. But I've been told I'm a scary person to some people. Start with me. You gotta want it. You gotta love it. If you don't love it, there's no point in it. Paul started the passage by telling us that Christ died to free us. To free us from a yoke of bondage. Part of it being filled with that bondage is fear. It's fear of letting go. It's fear of surrender. I'm sure there's a song somewhere that
something that you have to do that you dread getting up in the morning because of. And trust me, there are days it's tough to get out of bed. I get it. But the really cool thing is God says, it's okay. I got this. I will help you through it. Will you? He doesn't even get upset. And he won't get upset tomorrow when you're going through it again. Or next week or next month. But if you keep trying, it gets easier. You have to remember, open up your hands. Accept what he's given. If you can accept it, he can help you express your faith through love and give your heart the desire to do it. He's done it for you. You just have to go, God, we're good. Now walk me through it. Heavenly Father, on this day you've given us a lot to think about. It's been a, a fun journey to get to this morning. Your grace, which you freely give, is more than sufficient for anything that I could ever, ever think about. As we go through this week, I would just ask you to touch each and every person where they are. Point them in the direction that, that, that they, they need. Help them understand that their wants aren't always what's good. But what they need is better. And that they just have to learn to trust you. To come to you and ask you for that guidance. I would ask that as we go through these, these upcoming weeks that, that we always think of the people who are in need and who have hurts and we just lift them up. Specifically today, I want to lift up Pastor Brian and Tanisha and the kids that are all headed up to the kids' camp and all the families and kids that are traveling to the camp that you would just be with them and, and, and provide a, a wonderful, warm experience for these little to go through, to, to see your love in action. The teens that are helping, I want you to just touch them and give them a spirit of, of just leadership and, and, and teaching so that they can help the littles grow and mature. And Lord, as we go through this week, you know our trials and our struggles. I would just ask that you would be with each person and with 